So the goal today is to talk about barrier method and remember the idea in barrier method is that you want to minimize the function over a set capital X such that GX is less than equal to zero so you have inequality constraint and the idea is that you want to create a barrier around the boundary So this uh, this line is basically gx equal to zero. And then I create a barrier function b of x uh, around the boundary. And then I want to minimize fx plus some multiplier multiplied by b of x. So, <clears throat> so there are some assumptions I need to make. in order for the barrier method to work. So the first assumption is X is closed set. The second assumption is typically X would be RN, but it could also be some other closed set like a hyperplane. Um, the other assumption is X in capital X such that G of X strictly less than zero is non-empty. And the third assumption is zero should be a subset of These are the technical assumptions we need. And I'm going to define this set by S. So This will set will have a special name S, uh, which we will be using throughout the description of this algorithm. Professor, I have a question on the assumption three. Yes. How is it that the term on the left hand side is a subset of the one well, on the right? Well, it could be equal as well. Uh, so um, the way this, so this is exactly how it's written in the book. Uh, so every point in this set can be approximated arbitrarily closely by points in this set. Um, but, you know, I usually consider so, you know, in this class, we are always considering G to be a continuous function. In fact, G would be a differentiable function. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this equality will always hold. Okay. However, in more general situations, the equality may not hold. So that's why that's, I think perhaps that's the reason why the author of the book has written it in this fashion. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the assumptions are pretty straightforward. So X needs to be a closed set. Uh, you want a point, uh, a feasible point that is in the interior of the set. So GX has to be strictly less than zero. It has to, this set S has to be non-empty. And any point in the feasible set can, should be able to be approximated by, uh, we should be able to approximate it by uh, points in the set GX strictly less than zero. So this is my set S bar. Okay, now what's the general algorithm of barrier method? So I define XK 
to be the argument over x in capital X, fx plus epsilon k bx, where bx is this barrier function that we will construct shortly. Okay, and epsilon k is a sequence that goes to zero. So you start with a very large epsilon k and then you reduce the value of epsilon k, compute xk, and then reduce the value of epsilon k again, then compute xk plus one and so on and so forth. That's the overall algorithm. Okay. Now what kind of barrier functions are typical in the literature? So two functions that are very uh, famous, log barrier function So B of X equals to minus summation J equals one to R natural log minus GJ of X. Okay, so I want you to think about what are the properties of such a barrier function. So is BX continuous? Is B a continuous function of X? No, no comment. Well, it's composition of continuous function. So B of X, I mean, B must be a continuous function of X because we are assuming that GJ is are all continuous and differentiable. But there are other cool properties also that satisfied by this uh, barrier function B of X. So what happens when GJ of X is far away from zero? So remember, we, we want G, G of X less than equal to zero. So, so let's look at, this is my constraint set G of X equals to zero. And this is the region where gj of x is less than equal to zero. And if I'm, if I'm sitting at this point here, if this is the point x or x1, my barrier, the value of the barrier function b of x1 is going to be positive, but very small. Like not very small, but, uh, uh, but it will be reasonably small. It, it won't be too high. Right, but now as we start moving towards the boundary, let's say I'm standing here at X2, uh, one of these constraints will become active. I mean, it will be close to zero. So minus of something very small, so minus of epsilon 
sorry, this is minus of minus of epsilon. So because gj of x will be minus epsilon. So it's close to the boundary. So it's minus epsilon. So that negative sign with this negative sign would become positive. And so then we'll have log of epsilon and then we have a negative sign here. So minus log of epsilon would become a very large number. And so as x approaches the boundary, the value of this function, barrier function would you know, escape to infinity. So this truly will go all the way to infinity. So it will look, the barrier function will look something like this. Okay, so as you get closer to the boundary, the value of the function will blow up to infinity. But far away from the boundary, the value of the barrier function will be very, very small. But it will still, uh, let me think if it is going to be positive or not. It doesn't seem like it's going to be positive. Uh, no, it won't be positive, yeah. But it will be positive in this case, but not positive in this case. Okay. So any, any question with the barrier function? So what's the theoretical result? So assuming that you pick epsilon k goes to zero, your xk, if your xk converges to x bar, then x bar is the optimal solution. If epsilon k goes to zero, xk converges to x bar, then x bar is optimal. X bar is a global minimum. And the reason why X bar is a global minimum is because you're solving an argument problem at every point of time when you are looking for the barrier function, uh, looking for this minimization here in this equation. Okay, any, any questions so far on this barrier function approach? Mm -hmm. Professor, uh, I have one question. Yes. Uh, in this, uh, have we assumed that the solution that we want is inside the, the closed set? Can't it be on the boundary? If it is on boundary, then the barrier function will explode at, at that point. Excellent, excellent question. So, so remember your function f is continuous, right? Yes. So let's say your optimal solution, this is your optimal solution x star, right? And you are basically approaching this point from the inside because your epsilon k goes to zero, right? So you're trying to approach this point from the inside. Now, let's say after 1 million time steps, so if k equals to 10 raised to six, you are very close to x star. You are approximately optimal because, because the function f is continuous. It's not that the value at this x k will be approximately equal to the value at x star. So you are approximately optimal, right? Yes, okay. Right, so that's the, that's the point of barrier method. So. Uh, if your if your solution if your optimal solution is at the boundary you will get arbitrarily close to the optimal solution but you won't you will never be able to reach there um, because because of the way the barrier function works. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This was not the case with manifold suboptimization. So in manifold suboptimization method you could reach anywhere within the set, including the boundary. But the interior point method uh, says that you cannot reach the boundary. You will always be away from the boundary in finite number of steps. Any other question? So is this, does this converge uh, to a solution slower if the uh, solution is near the boundary because then you have to wait for epsilon to get small enough. Yes. Yeah, so you will define a tolerance factor and uh, you want to make sure that you are within the epsilon of the optimal solution. So, so you want your f of x k to be less than 
f of x star plus epsilon. And we will see the example for linear programming with barrier function with the log barrier function. And we will identify conditions that can ensure that you will reach there in finite number of iterations. Okay, and this epsilon is something that you, well, okay, I'm using epsilon twice. Maybe I should use delta here. So this delta is something that you will pick. Like I want to get to um, 10 raised to minus six of the optimal solution and the interior point method will, will get there and will tell you that, okay, this is the point at which you are close to the optimal solution within the tolerance level of the optimal solution. Okay. So now uh, we are going to solve the following problem. I want to minimize C transpose X. So it's a linear programming problem such that AX is equal to B, X is greater than equal to zero. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define my set X, which is X in Rn such that AX equal to B and X is strictly positive. So all the elements of X are strictly positive. And I'm going to use the barrier function. So this is minus summation log of x xi. So is B of X convex? The question is, is B from S to R convex? Yes. Why? Uh, because natural log is concave, so the negative right. is convex, and then Perfect. the sum of any convex functions are is also convex. Perfect. Excellent. So log is concave. Sorry, concave. So minus log is convex, and then sum of minus log is also convex function. Excellent. Okay, so now let's set up our uh, problem, uh, our uh, uh, barrier function approach to solving this uh, linear programming problem. So I have linear objective function C transpose X. I add a barrier function. So F X plus epsilon K B of X. So my epsilon K is positive. And so this, this is convex, this is convex, and my X is in S. So the set S itself is also convex. So this is actually a convex optimization problem. Okay, and it will have a unique solution, XK. For every epsilon K, there will be a solution XK. So in fact, let me, uh, change this a little bit. I, I'm going to just put a parameter epsilon here and I'm going to define this as X epsilon. Okay, so this is X as a function of epsilon. Well, should I use X star? Maybe I should use X star, X star epsilon. Okay, so that's the optimal solution of um, the objective function, which is C transpose X and the barrier function, logarithmic barrier function B of X. Great. So,
So, how would we solve this argument over? So, this is a convex objective function. How are we going to solve this argument over a convex set? What do you think we should do? We have done a whole bunch of lectures on optimization over convex set. So what kind of algorithm would you pick? Remember what, what all things did we study? We studied conditional gradient method, gradient projection method. Uh, Newton's method um, and uh, what else? Manifold suboptimization method, right? So we studied all these different methods to solve uh, optimization problem over convex set. So what what should we pick here? What can we do here? Can we just do Newton's method? Newton's method. Why would you pick Newton's method to solve this problem? Any thoughts? Why should Newton's method be the choice for this problem? Let's let's think about it, okay? So let's think about, so what do, what do we need to know in order to apply Newton's method? So the first thing, whenever Newton's method comes to mind, the first thing that should come to mind is second derivative, okay? So all this while we have always talked about Newton's method and we have said, well, we need to compute second derivative and not just we need to compute second derivative, we actually have to invert the second derivative. So we always thought it seems like a horrible problem to, to, to work on. So let's look at the second derivative of this objective function. Let me call this F epsilon of X. So what's the first derivative of this function? So the gra gradient of C transpose X minus epsilon log of Xi. What's the derivative? So I, I, let me help you. So the first C transpose X, the derivative of that is just C itself. Minus epsilon is a constant. And now I have to take the derivative of sum of log of Xi. What would the derivative be like? Would that be one plus natural log of Xi? one plus log of xi. Sorry, one over xi, yeah. One over xi, great. Somebody else wrote on the chat window. Yes. So one over x1, one over xn. Okay, cool. So it seems to me that computation of first derivative is not a problem because I know x so I can readily invert it. And remember we are doing optimization in the set capital S where each element of X is positive. So I can really invert it without any problem. Now let's look at the second derivative of the function. What's the second derivative? So well, the derivative of C will be zero and then I have negative epsilon and then I have the derivative of this uh, one over Xi vector, yeah. Uh, I think it is uh, the sum of one over x i. Sum over one over x i. Yeah. Uh, no, because the derivative. Okay, so this is del sum of log x i over del x one. Yeah, I got, I got it. Thank okay, you. yeah. Cool. Okay, so what's the second derivative here? What 
diagonal matrix of one of one over x x i squares. Yeah. It's a diagonal matrix with one over x i square. Okay. So looks like the second derivative inverse is not really a bad computation. It's actually pretty simple computation. Okay. Does that make sense? So we, we, we came up with this. Uh, we, have, we want to apply the barrier method. So for fixed epsilon, we wanted to figure out a way to some, compute this argument. Turns out we can compute it exactly because it's a convex optimization over convex set. And in order to do quick computation, we, as we have learned through our experience that Newton's method is very quick, as long as computing second derivative inverse is not a problem. And so we want to employ Newton's method for solving this minimization problem. And it looks like the computation of first derivative and the computation of second derivative is pretty straightforward. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a notation just for this class, which is, I'm going to say X inverse and that would mean element wise inverse. And I'm going to define this matrix X, which is basically diagonal of X, small X, which is X1 to Xn. Okay. This is the notation I'm going to use in this class. Okay. So with that, let me set up the Newton's method now. So no. What's the Newton's method? I want to minimize X bar equals to, I want to minimize X in capital X. No, let me put Y here. Over two. Uh, y minus x plus so this is as we have seen before, C minus epsilon X inverse. And this is epsilon X raised to minus two. Oh, y is in capital S. So this is equivalent to saying, I want my Y to be greater than zero and I want a Y to be equal to B. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so it turns out that this problem, uh, it's a constrained optimization problem. So I'm going to ignore this y greater than zero constraint. I just want to minimize this function over a y equals to b. I want to minimize this uh, complicated expression over a y equals to b. And, uh, and, and that's, 
and we will hope that the elements of that particular minimum should be greater than zero. So it will turn out that that's going to be the case. So it turns out X bar can be written as X minus epsilon inverse X square C minus epsilon X inverse Okay, so I can actually compute this solution exactly, assuming that I'm going to ignore, so what I've done is I've ignored this, this uh, condition y greater than zero, I've just computed the minimum for this a y equals to b, with the hope that I can pick my parameters epsilon appropriately so that this whole term is going to be positive. Okay. Any any question on this Newton step? Okay. So, uh, what do you think about being able to compute this quantity? So, once I know x, how difficult is it to compute this quantity? Is it easy or is it difficult? Seems pretty pretty easy, right? So the only difficulty might come, might appear in this situation where you have to take a x squared trans a transpose inverse, but because it's an equality constraint problem, the number of elements in a is going to be smaller than the dimension of the x itself. So this particular inverse can perhaps be computed rather easily. So this is a matrix in M cross M where a is in our m cross n. So actually, m is always going to be less than n. So therefore, this computation is going to be rather easy. So it turns out that Newton's step is easy to take in uh, this particular example, in this particular problem. OK. So what have we done so far? Uh, Let's go back to the beginning. So we had this linear programming problem. We computed log, we thought we will use log barrier function here. And in order to use the log barrier function for a fixed epsilon, we need to solve this optimization problem. And we weren't quite sure what kind of optimization algorithm we can use to solve this uh, convex optimization problem. But somebody suggested in your class, we should use Newton's method and uh, constraint Newton's method. And so we went ahead, we computed the first two derivatives of the function, of the objective function. Turns out that we can actually compute the descent direction for the constraint Newton's method rather easily. Okay. So looks like a feasible approach so far to solve this uh, optimization problem, linear programming problem. So let's see how this algorithm is going to work. So let's start with epsilon equals to infinity. What is my x infinity? It's actually argmin of b of x, x and s, x star infinity. 
then we will have some finite epsilon let's say epsilon equals to 10 and we will compute x star 10 okay and then we need to reduce epsilon equals to 5 and then i have to compute x star 5 and so on so within for every value of epsilon so remember we have to take infinitely many values of epsilon uh, because we have to keep reducing the value of epsilon starting from a very high number and we have to compute an argument which means we need to run infinite number of iterations within each iteration and there are infinite number of outer iterations so let's call this outer iteration and in order to solve this argument problem i'll have to do some inner iterations to solve it right in order to compute the argument so we have infinity multiplied by infinity number of iterations to do how can we simplify it so now you are all optimizers how can we simplify so many iterations that we need to do Any, any thoughts, how can we reduce the number of iterations to get close to the optimal point? We don't have to exactly get to the optimal point. We just have to be close to it. Is there a chat? Is there a clever way to pick epsilon? Okay, that's that's a good starting point. So first, we probably need to figure out a way to let me say decrease epsilon because you have to pick epsilon at every point of time. So if we can have a careful algorithm to decrease epsilon, we can potentially converge faster to the optimal solution. What else? What else can we do? Any other thoughts? So you've talked about outer iteration, how to simplify or how to manage outer iteration, which is by identifying a more intelligent way of decreasing epsilon. How about uh, minimizing the complexity of inner iterations? So let's, let's think about it. So we only want to get close to the optimal solution. We don't want to be like we know that we can't get to the optimal solution. We just want to get close to the optimal solution. Now we need infinite number of inner iterations in order to get to the optimal solution, but we only need finite number of inner iterations, particularly because we are using Newton's method. So we only need finite number of inner iterations to get close to the optimal solution for that particular epsilon. So that's the idea of uh, using the barrier method for linear programming, which is run a few inner iterations, reduce the value of epsilon uh, appropriately, run a few inner iterations, then reduce the value of epsilon and so on, right? So you keep continue doing this again and again. So let's look at a pictorial way. So run only a few inner iterations. In fact, the Algorithm I will introduce requires you to run only one inner iteration. Okay. 
So here is how the algorithm will work. So let me draw the constraint set. So this is my constraint set. And this is my X star. Uh, this is the X star for the original problem. And this is my X star infinity. This is my X star 10. This is my X star five. This is my X star one and so on, right? So I can actually trace a path which looks something like this. Okay, so this is your X star of epsilon. So this is the path as you reduce the value of epsilon from infinity to zero, uh, this is the path that you are going to trace. And this path is called the central path. For this linear programming problem. Okay, and so my algorithm would be as follows. So initially I'll start from some initial condition X zero, and then I will run a few Newton's iteration to get close to say X star of 100. Oh, sorry, this is not X star of 100. X star of 100 will be somewhere here. This will be X star of 100. Okay, and then I'm going to reduce the value of epsilon. I'm going to run another Newton's path, get close to x star 10. Then I will run, then I'll change my value of epsilon from 10 to 5, then run a few Newton's iteration, get close to x star 5. Then I'll change my value of epsilon from 5 to 1, run a few iteration, Newton's iteration, get close to x star 1, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's my algorithm. So I'm not going to do trace the central path exactly. I'm just going to be close to the central path throughout my iterations. Okay. So we need to now, there are two things that we need to figure out. One is a way to decrease the value of epsilon and a way to identify um, way to identify whether or not we are close to x we are close to the central path so the equation the two prime task two prime is come up with a method to check if we are if if x k is close to x star epsilon k. Okay, so that will determine how many inner iterations we need to run. So if you are close to x star epsilon k, we can just proceed and reduce the value of epsilon k because we are close to the central path. So we can go to step one and then again, run a few inner iterations and check if you are close to central path, then again, check change epsilon k. Okay, so two and two prime are similar tasks. Two prime is a bit more uh, precise algorithmically what we need to do. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, we, we are just five minutes. We just have five minutes. So let me, uh, so so let me pause here for questions. Are there any questions on the way this algorithm works? Okay, so we start from any initial condition x naught, get close to the central path, change epsilon run some Newton's iteration, get close to the central path, and so on and so forth. That's how this algorithm proceeds. 
So let me introduce a quantity which will allow us to understand whether or not we are close to the central path or not. So remember I had introduced x bar and x above. So let me define q of x comma epsilon to be x inverse x bar minus x. So I'm standing at x. My current value of epsilon is epsilon. And I'm going to define q of x epsilon as x inverse x bar minus x. It can be written as x z over epsilon minus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And z is c minus a transpose lambda. Lambda has been introduced above. And the remarkable property of this vector q is as follows. So norm of q x epsilon is zero if and only if x is equal to x star epsilon. So I can use the norm of this vector Q as a measure of how close X is with X star of epsilon. Okay, this is the most important part of this algorithm. Is it difficult to compute Q of X epsilon? So let's look at it. So this is diagonal vector X. Z is C minus A transpose lambda. So it's uh, easy because lambda is something we need to compute. So Z is easy to compute. Epsilon is given and this is just all ones. So Q of X epsilon is actually extremely easy to compute. It only depends on X and it only depends on epsilon. But what's cool is just by measuring these numbers, uh, I mean, just by measuring the norm of Q of X epsilon, I can get an idea of whether I'm close to the central path or I'm far away from the central path. Okay. So what I'm going to do in the next class is we will use this. This is the big, big revelation of today's class. So this thing that without actually computing any sort of distance or, or any complicated function just by looking at just norm of this Q um, vector, I can measure that X is close to X star epsilon. And that can help us tremendously in speeding up the algorithm and figuring out a way to reduce the value of epsilon. And so I'm going to talk about those things in the next class and complete the description of this algorithm for um, for linear programming problem. Okay, I'll stay back for any questions you may have, but uh, if you don't have any questions, feel free to leave the class.
Oh, and I do have office hours uh, after this. So I'll be available from three to four if you have any questions on, on any of the things we are doing in the class. Are you planning to have any kind of review session before the midterm? Uh, I'm not planning on having any review session, but uh, uh, do you need a review session? I, I was just wondering. Um, yeah, I'm not planning on having any review session. This, uh, yeah, I, I'm not planning to do any reviews this year. Okay. Yeah. W would it be possible to, since the midterms on Friday, then to maybe move your office hours to like Thursday, if there's any last oh, minute? Oh, that's an excellent suggestion. Yes, I'll definitely do that. I'll send out a new office hours time for everyone in the class. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion, yeah. Uh, the midterm is in class, right? Well, or... no, it's going to be, uh, I'll, I'll, there'll be 24 hour window when you have to write down your solution and you have to submit it on Garmin. Oh, okay, so we'll have the entire Friday to do it? You will have the entire Friday to do it. Okay, thank yeah. you. But it'll be one hour class, one hour. So I'm I'm timing it. I'm timing the midterm so that it only takes one hour to do the midterm. So it's not going to take a whole day to solve the problem. Oh, okay. Yeah. Professor, I have a question as a follow up to this. Um, the property you just mentioned. So typically, um, Q will never will it ever be equal to zero absolutely right. or will it be within a you know a threshold that we define so Let's we say. will define the threshold to be some value less than one mm -hmm. and we will always take the steps so that we reach a point where q is less than one and then we change the value of epsilon okay yeah so i think you are saying that i don't quite know what close and far means so there yes. has to be a threshold to figure out what is close and what is far. Yes. So, so yes. So one will be that critical point. So less than one is close and greater than one would be far. Okay. Yeah. Professor. Uh, yes. I have a doubt in the property, property itself. Uh, okay. Like what is X bar here and what is X? Like, isn't we finding an X that can, that, X bar is the argument of some function that. So X bar, the way I have defined is this one one Newton step. So so X bar is the argument of this Newton's method uh, with a y equals to b. So I'm I'm ignoring this y greater than zero comment and I'm just doing it doing the minimization over a y equals to b. Uh, okay, uh, so. X bar is uh, the argument that we are getting uh, after running one uh, Newton's method. Yes. Iteration of Newton's method, or like it is for a single epsilon, it is the X bar. Like for epsilon, epsilon, uh, sorry, epsilon, we are getting the X bar at the end after running multiple iterations of uh, Newton's method. Right, so X bar is just one iteration, one one step of Newton's method. So if you want to use multiple steps of Newton method, then you will start with X, you will compute X bar one, then you will substitute X bar one here, then compute X bar two, and then you will substitute X bar two here and compute X bar three. Okay. Right, so that's a multiple Newton step. But one Newton step is, is you start with X, you have fixed epsilon, and you want to compute just one step of the Newton's method, which is X bar. Okay, so in property, uh, yes. If that is the X bar, then what is X there in the property? So, right. So X is any generic uh, point in the space. So let's go back to this figure. This is my central path. Let's say I fig my X epsilon to be 10. So I want to get close to this X star 10 point and I'm standing here at X, right? So one Newton step would be this X bar. Let me mm -hmm. call it X bar one. 
the second Newton step would be x bar 2 and the third Newton step will be x bar 3, right? Yes. And this Q of x comma epsilon, so for, for epsilon fixed, you can substitute, you can compute Q of x comma epsilon, Q of x1 bar comma epsilon, you can compute Q of x2 bar comma epsilon, right? Mm. Right, so you can see the progress of how close you are to the central path. So you can see the progress of how close you are to this X star 10. Sorry, the epsilon is 10. So let me maybe make it 10 here. Is, was that your question or? Uh, yeah, I understood what is X bar in the, like, in the property that the, the definition that you showed the two X epsilon. Yeah, this is the f one uh, Newton step from X. So X bar is one Newton step from X. So X is the current point. This is the next point. Okay. 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 Because this is, this comes after one Newton step. So you're standing at X, you take one Newton step, you get at X bar, right? Okay. So that's the next point, next iterate. Okay. I understood, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any other question on the... Okay, great. Uh, so I'll be available for office hours in about 10, 15 minutes from now. Uh, see you in office hours. Have a great weekend, uh, rest of you.